ever walked into an interview feeling nervous, found yourself rambling or winging it? Are you going through interviews but not closing the deal? These common challenges could be keeping you from standing out as the star candidate. If this sounds familiar, then today's episode on how to be the star candidate in interviews is for you. Hello and welcome to the Dare to Differentiate show, where we're all about owning your voice, value, and visibility with confidence. Comment to let us know where you're tuning in from. I'm your host, Diana YK Chan, LinkedIn Top Voice of 2022, LinkedIn Learning Instructor, and founder of My Marketability, where I help you differentiate your brand and advocate for yourself with confidence. Whether you're tuning in live or watching the replay, I am so delighted that you're here. If we're not connected yet, make sure to follow me on LinkedIn, Instagram, and my YouTube channel. All right. Hello, hello. Oh, my goodness. We have an amazing audience here from Scotland, UK, Boston, Oakland, Finland, Toronto, Richmond, amazing, Ghana, Pakistan. Welcome, welcome, welcome. All right. So today we'll conquer interview hurdles with the help of my phenomenal co-host, Anna Bellavea, a top career coach and job search strategist and founder of The Career Diet. Anna's mission is to help ambitious professionals stand out as star candidates, escape underemployment, and land exciting corporate jobs that push their boundaries. Within a few years, she's helped over 600 professionals globally through her signature, the Star Candidate Program. She's also among the top 1% of instructors for course sales on Thinkific, with her best-selling courses on Network Like a Pro and Master the Interview. And she has a growing community of 280,000 followers across Instagram, TikTok, and LinkedIn. So make sure to follow her. Let's give her some love. Type in hashtag GoAnna as well. Amazing, amazing. Okay, so just a little background story. I met Anna just over a month ago where she attended my lecture retreat and business mastermind. We became fast friends and have been supporting each other since pretty much every single day since we got back here. All right, so here's what we're going to cover today. We're going to talk about a little bit about uh, Anna's journey, our recruitment and industry insights, three-star candidate traits, storytelling and interviews, overcoming interview anxiety, spawning interview red flags, showcasing unique skills, nonverbal communication skills, and how to handle tough interview questions. So if you're excited, type in a plus one. Type in a plus one if you're excited. Oh my goodness, we have an amazing audience live with us. Amazing, amazing. So some housekeeping, replays will be available. You can hop onto my YouTube channel later on where we'll be adding timestamps for easy viewing. I want to encourage you to engage with us. Click like, come anytime, ask questions, support one another as well. Okay. All right. So let's get started on this journey towards becoming the star candidate in interviews and landing your ideal job. Let's welcome Anna to the show. Hello. 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 Welcome, my friend. Thank you so much for being here today. I love that we're collaborating. I know. Thank you for having me. And thank for thank you for such a warm welcome. <laughs> Of course, of course. I know there's a lot of people here. I bet you a lot of them are also from Instagram. Um, I would love to hear like some from the audience as well, how you discover us. Like, was it through Instagram or LinkedIn? Tell us a little bit more here. I see an amazing audience. We're excited. Over 100 people live with us right now on LinkedIn here, Anna. So I hope I you're really excited. <laughs> let's so let's all learn how to nail your next interview. Exactly, exactly. So we're going to kick things off. And how things are going to work is we're, I'm going to first ask Anna some couple of questions for us to get to know her. And then we're going to take turns asking questions where we both share our uh, best advice from our recruitment experience and coaching experience. So Anna, why don't you kick things off? Tell us what insights from your time in the recruitment industry have been the most influential in shaping your current work as a career coach? <laughs> well, so many <laughs> but if you know anything about me i like things in threes and by the way great tip for for interviews is to to deliver information in threes but um i want to highlight specifically the three insights that i really took away from my experience in the recruitment industry and that i teach and preach every single day and i have recruited for hundreds of different roles with some of the top employers in the country really at all levels, starting from entry level roles that did not even require a degree to multiple six figure roles. So really all across the board. And this holds true what I'm going to talk about in the next couple of minutes for all of that. 
So first one, and that's the big one, is that it is really, really hard for the employer to actually find the right talent at all of those levels. So as a candidate, my friend, <laughs> you have actually a lot more power than you've been taught your entire life that you have because they're looking for you and they're really struggling to find you. Number two, there is a lot that happens behind the scenes in recruitment that you're not previous. And we can talk about this for a while. I actually have a series coming out a couple of weeks from now where I'll be sharing all of those behind the scenes. But the most important piece that you need to take away that happens behind the scenes that you don't usually see is that employers don't actually rely on online applications. Uh, we in recruitment used to call it lazy recruitment. <laughs> we used to say that it's just post and pray that the right candidate will come to you. Instead, most employers actually rely on headhunting and referrals, which is actually good news for you because this means that you have a lot more control of the process over the process this way because now you can build a profile that gets headhunted. Now you can get referrals instead of just applying and waiting and not knowing what's going on. So that's a big one to take away. And the final one that I want to mention is that employers are looking for what we used to say in recruitment, star candidates. And the star candidate, and I know that Diana and I will talk about it in a bit more detail uh, later in the show today, but the star candidate doesn't mean that you have fancy names on your resumes. In fact, whether it's you know school names or, or company names, it's not really about anything fancy on your resume, but rather about how you show up and how you market yourself. And employers are desperate to find those kind of candidates. And Knowing this, uh, I wanted to be, knowing all of these insights, I wanted to be the career coach who shows you what happens behind the scenes, what it really is like, so that you feel empowered. You feel like you can, you have the control over the process, over your career, and you hold the power as the candidate. I love that. I love the story. And I can really relate to that, especially around how you show up and how you market yourself. Like this is something I've seen my time as a recruiter when I recruited at Google, recruiting for the top 1% and recruiting for a top business school. It's all about how we convey our value there. Mm -hmm. So Anna, my next question is, how has um, your experience across different cities and countries shaped your career coaching approach? I know you have like a very big international <laughs> audience here. I do. And I think uh, the fact that my audience is so international and a lot of my clients are really international, 30 plus countries, really is uh, because they, they can connect to where I come from and my story. And if you don't know, I've lived in five countries, uh, four different languages. And uh, right now I'm in Canada, in Toronto. And I went from being an international student, speaking a foreign language every single day, being broke and not knowing what to do, no connections to getting to a point where I was headhunted for six figure roles abroad and changing career three times without starting from the bottom or taking a pay cut. So uh, if you're you're at a point where you're changing careers and you're struggling or if you're if you're new <laughs> anywhere, whether it's it's country, city, I've definitely been there. And a few things that I, I learned through this experience. Uh, one is that anything is possible. <laughs> anything is possible. Big dreams, big moves are absolutely possible for you because I made it happen. I've seen my clients make insane moves across industries and countries and cities and still be successful. You can make those moves and still be successful. And uh, the second thing that I'll, I'll mention here is that I've also learned that what is what you think is holding you back. And for me, that was my, I thought was my accent and lack of local experience. I actually learned that it is something that makes you different instead. It's something that makes you unique. It actually is your selling point. And when I switched that, I, I stopped worrying about, about, my accent and where I come from and not being local, um, my career actually really skyrocketed because I really shifted it to 
this is what I bring instead. I'm something, someone who lived in five countries and this is what I learned. Um, and this is something that I really teach my clients as well, how to how to turn what they think is holding them back into their selling point and how to look at it as, as their strength rather than something that they should try to, to almost hide. That is so amazing. I love that, right? Looking at your wings turning into like a strength and asset, right? I just want to give a shout out and say hello to our friends here, Johan and Sweta, who's on the show watching as well. Thank you so much for, for being here. Oh my goodness, we have such an interactive audience. I love it. Next, we're going to kick off is moving into like giving you guys offer tips and advice. And we're going to be asking each other questions so that we can share our best advice here. So, mm -hmm. and I'll let you kick off here. Yeah. So how about we start with some of the common interview mistakes here? Common interview mistakes. Oh, I love this question, right? I, I, I'm curious to hear how many of you actually will either ramble or go off tangent in interviews, like type in a plus one, right? Especially when you're, you're nervous. So from my days, having done like thousands of interviews when I recruited at Google and at an agency and at a top MBA school, here are the four things that I've noticed out of the four common interview mistakes that could lead to a rejection. It's called my four C's. So the first C is lacking clear communication. Communication is so key for the interviewers to really understand what you're trying to tell them, what's the key message, and how you're the best qualified candidate. So if you are nervous or if you've gone to an interview for some time, you may go off tangent there. So that's the number one, I would say, the mistake that I see people make is the lack of clear communication. And I see this a lot when I practice mock interviews with my clients is that they just they don't necessarily have a structure. Number two is lacking compelling examples. So this ties into the storytelling, right? So it all goes back to whether you're telling great stories and examples that showcase that you are the right fit, you're the star candidate for the role. And a big part of the strategy is really understanding what the role entails, what they're looking for, what's important to the hiring manager, and be able to really map out what are the core theme stories that you want to tell there. So I always say the proof, which is really the evidence of support to showcase that you're a high potential candidate. The third C is the lack of confidence, lack of confidence, right? If you're going in an interview feeling nervous, you won't show up as confident. You won't sound as confident, right? You won't appear as confident. And confidence is key because you are also showcasing whether you can persuade the employer that you have what it takes. Even though you may not have 100% of the qualifications, but are you confident enough of figuring it out? Are you resourceful? Are you showcasing that you can solve the problem there? So that's a third piece. And the last four C is about lack of connection. So this is really around that energy, charisma, and chemistry between you and the interviewer. Do they feel like they trust you? Do they like you? Do they want to work with you? This is all about how you interact with them from the first moment you meet them of that breaking the ice to communicating and talking to them throughout the entire interview, how you can also ask them questions as well, where that feels like a two-way conversation versus feeling at a robotic or monotone there. So those are my four common interview mistakes. Anything you want to add, Anna? I was just thinking how I really love that you have the four C's that they're really easy to remember that really easy for you guys to have on a little sticky note in front of you as you're prepping for for an interview but I think these are these are really really good and I think we'll, we'll dive into some of these a little bit a little bit more in detail as we as we keep going but um I was just um, doing a mock interview with someone, someone this morning, and we actually talked about confidence as as one of the things that he needed to really kind of bring up a little bit more with just how he show up and he his body language, and especially especially if you're going for a high level role, that just becomes so so much more important. Yeah, absolutely. Especially at high level or even next level role. Like one of the things yeah. what I find is that if you're going to a next level role, talking about your leadership potential is so critical there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So my question for you, Anna, is what are the three traits that make a star candidate? 
Oh my gosh. I love this question so much because if, for those of you who know me, I talk about star candidates all the freaking time because again, as I said, this is actually something that came from back when I was in recruitment, we kept saying we're looking for star candidates. And I feel like as a candidate, you don't really know what that means and what the employer is really looking for. And that's why my, my, coaching program is called the start candidate because that's where I turn you into that, that start candidate. So what does that mean? So I'll give you three of what the start candidate is not. <laughs> and the three uh, main things of what the start candidate is. So the start candidate does not submit hundreds of job applications. And if you just felt like, Ooh, oh, you just called me out. That's okay. <laughs> That's okay. That's why we're here. Uh, we're going to, to learn what to do instead, right? So the star candidate does not submit hundreds of applications mindlessly, right? The star candidate goes into an interview hoping, does not go into an interview hoping and praying to be picked. If any of you here watched uh, Grey's Anatomy and remember that scene, pick me choose me while well, he did not want to be that. <laughs> and let me know in the comments if that resonated, if any of you watch Grey's Anatomy and know what I'm talking about. The star candidate does not, my friend, settle for a job that is not their dream job. You don't settle. If you're a star candidate, you know you have options. So who is the star candidate? Well, it's someone who knows that their, that their job revolves around their lifestyle, around their dream lifestyle not the other way around. I think too many of us tend to do the other way where we first get a job, get a career, and then we build our lifestyle around that. If you are the star candidate, you know that it's the other way around. The star candidate also goes into interviews and I would say networking as well, knowing that it's a it's a conversation, that it's a two-way street, that it's it's a conversation when where you are also determining whether you want that role, whether you want that company, whether you want that opportunity, and not just trying to convince them that they need to ha have you and need to hire you. So remember, it's a two-way street, and as a star candidate, know that very well. And finally, and that's the most important piece, the star candidate is someone who is in the driver's seat of their career. You're not begging to pick you and choose you. You have options. You're in the driver's seat. Oh, I love this. This is so good. I want to add on a few more things. I love this. The difference between not a star and star candidate. I'm going to add on a few more tactics here for those who want a bit more tactics as well. Like when I was working at Google, we talked about finding the high potential candidate, which is similar to the star, uh, star candidate. And something that I've learned as a recruiter that I build down is really what I call my P's here. The first is you really want to talk about your progression in your career. How have you grown in your career? That growth trajectory. Second is you want to talk about your performance. So this is showcasing that you're a top performer, highlighting your accomplishments and results versus your responsibilities. And the third piece is all about talking around your promotions. If you had a fast track career, let's say you got promoted within like a year or multiple promotions in a couple of years, you want to highlight that. These are all indicators to the employer that you're a high potential candidate there. If I need to add on a few more bonuses, what I would say, because I'm really big on personal branding there, is to really talk about also your personal brand, which is like part of your unique value proposition of what really truly differentiates you. That's another piece that you want to highlight to showcase that you're high potential talent there. Yeah. And it's something that we, as I really want to echo that it's something that, that, that kind of piece around, around results is something that I talk about all the time with, with my clients and something that we used to really look for in candidates in recruitment. And it's that kind of star potential. You need to show that you are a superstar at what you've done before, because it shows the employer that you will be a superstar at whatever you do next. It yeah. shows a pattern. That's why. And, and it can be any area of your life. If you're, let's say, early in your career and you're like, well, but I haven't gotten any promotions yet. Being a superstar can be a superstar at school, at uh, internships, at clubs that you're part of, sports. It can be any area of your life you want to show that you are a superstar. So that's how I would always think about when you go into interviews, when you're writing your resume, how do I show them that I'm a superstar at what I've done before?
Yeah. Type in hashtag superstar here. Hashtag superstar. <laughs> so Anna, we have a question from the audience and we could take it. This as a great question here that I think we can give a, a bit of context. Cindy asks, what's the real meaning behind a rejection around not being the right fit? When someone, I guess a recruiter rejects that we're not the right fit. What's the real meaning behind that? <laughs> The answer is it depends. <laughs> there, there, there are a lot of things that can be happening. Number one, it can be that that you're you're lacking some of the skills that are a must have for the role, and it's just it's just that. And they potentially are looking at your profile and they're realizing, hey, like you're 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 missing some of the core skills that you need to be, need to have already in order to be successful in this role. It can be that where and how you've you've talked about where you want to go next, maybe that doesn't fit with what they're looking for from someone in this role. So there it can also be a cultural fit. So there, there are different things that can be going on here. Now I if it is a cultural fit and if it's not a fit, I don't think that's a bad thing. <laughs> I actually think because remember, you are also looking for that fit. And if they don't think it's a fit, maybe you dodge the bullet. Maybe it wasn't really the right fit. So I don't think that rejection <laughs> is a bad thing. Oftentimes it is redirection. So yeah. that's how I would I would look at it. Yeah, yeah. And I know it, it could be frustrating when you don't get the feedback, when you just all you get is not the right mm -hmm. fit. There. And I just know from my, my days as a recruiter, there's part of it is also, we don't, people don't want to go down the rabbit hole. There are actually also legal liability reasons that uh, recruiters are not allowed to give the reasons of why you're not the right fit uh, there, because that could go into a whole uh, rabbit hole there. Uh, but I think when I listed out the common interview mistakes and some, some things that you listed, those could be some of the reasons. From my experience as well, like having worked with a lot of candidates who faced rejections, Oftentimes, there could be incremental improvements we can make. So we want to focus mm -hmm. on what we can control, which is well around our positioning, our messaging. Are you really telling a great story? Are you really connecting the dots, showcasing your potential? Right. That, that's a really key thing. One of the mistakes I see a lot of people make is as they move forward in an interview, they still focus on talking about their past versus talking about the future of what they can do for the employer. As you move forward in the interview, you should have gathered enough insights to showcase your understanding of the job, the company, the problems, and how you can help them solve that problems. So you want to shift your strategy of conveying just about your past, but also talking about the future there. Yeah, I call it connecting the dots. So it's, it's around, hey, I'm a superstar at what I've done before, and this is what it means for you, Mr. and Mrs. Employer. This is how I'm going to, to do the same thing for you when I'm working here. So that that's what kind of part of connecting the dots for employer is. Absolutely. Absolutely. So let's move on to the next question uh, that you mm. have here. Yeah. Uh, so Diana, I know that you're, you're big on storytelling. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about that. Maybe you can, you can talk to us about the role of effective storytelling in interviews and maybe share some tips on how to do it well. Absolutely. Absolutely. So storytelling, storytelling is such a critical piece of acing your interviews. Like, why do we tell stories? The reason we tell stories is it's a lot more memorable, right? When you tell stories, it's 22 times more memorable. And it's also picture, uh, you're painting a picture of what you can do for an employer. When they hear stories, they're gonna be like, okay, you face this situation or you face this problem, you can probably do something like that. So it's an indicator of predicting future performance. Now the key here, a tips of storytelling here, is that most people spend too much time on the context. Mm -hmm. And I think you'll yeah. agree with me on that, Anna, is people tell too much of the a story, right? Too much detail of the story, but not the so what of the story. So one of my big tip here is you wanna tell the so what of the story which is going back to connect the dots. Like what is the message around the story? What's the so what, like what was the outcome of this? What was um, based on this story? What did you do and how did you help, right? So there's this common um, technique around telling like the hero's journey, right? So you would talk about the story of like, what was the problem 
of this situation? What was your task and mandate as the, the, the individual here? And how did you help essentially save the day there? And so that's really, really key. So a lot of times I find people go too much in the details, mm -hmm. but not specific of how does this tie back to like your communication skills, problem solving skills, leadership skills. That's a key part of really telling great stories there. Yeah, and I, I actually challenge my 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 clients, and I always say you get two sentences to talk about context. That's all. The rest of your answer is then, as you said, is what you actually did, so your actions and what the result was. And yes. bonus points if you can back to what we just talked about, connect the dots. That story those actions and the results that you just talked about, if you can connect it to the employer and bring it back, I call it bring it back to the employer and tell them why that matters to them. Yeah. And I think that is something that a lot of people miss because it feels like, well, I just told you that, you know, I increased sales by 20%. Like it should matter to you. Like it's obvious. No, <laughs> think about it's, it's the first rule of marketing. You need to explain to your customer or to someone who is going to buy from you, right? So that's the employer. You need to explain to them why this product is, matters to them. That's the rule of marketing. So the same yeah. with interview, you have to explain why the story matters to them, why this example, this result matters to them. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I was doing a, a mock interview a couple of weeks ago and one of my client was going through an interview where it was like a brand new role, a brand new division of product that they're selling in a marketing role. And so we really brainstorm, like, what are the challenges in a role, like a brand new role, right? The ability to handle ambiguity, mm -hmm. right? Things that are less like, structured or uh, they don't have all like the marketing uh, campaigns or strategy in place. So you can really brainstorm a ch the challenges you'll face in a role in this kind of situation, a brand new role. So the type of stories that she wants to tell is times when she was faced with ambiguity, times where she had to roll up her sleeves and be resourceful when she didn't have a playbook or times when she had to build up a strategy and plan. And from there, you can really identify like what are those signature stories that will convey specific aspects of what you're trying to convey. So I like to think of themes. So for example, mm -hmm. in this case, you can think of, okay, you want to showcase your ability to handle a bigger situation. That's one pillar of stories that you want to tell. Another is you want to showcase that your ability to work with cross-functional teams. Then you want to think of stories of how you work with cross-functional teams there. Another pillar could be the job description, say, your ability to present in front of executives, right? Creating pitch decks and present in front of executives. So you want to think of stories of when you did that. And interestingly, right, like those were the type of questions she got. Like you can predict the type of questions yeah. you'll get by assessing the role, the scope of the role there. Yeah, I actually did that with my client this morning when we did the mock interview. We quite literally opened the job description. We looked at what are, and that's actually how recruiters look at the job description when they're recruiting. They scan through it. They look for the three most important things for the role, whether it's skills, experience, maybe specific product that that person worked with, specific uh, technology. So three most important things that they're looking for from someone in this role and those are the questions they're going to ask you. So yeah. you can really predict what you will be asked based on what is important for the role. Absolutely. Right. Always predict questions, even though you think of those common questions, but you really want to go a level deeper of predicting questions because that's going to help you be even more strategic and more intentional. So my question for you, Anna, is how to handle interview anxiety. What are some of those strategies to handle interview anxiety? I always say that you need to develop calluses. What? What does that mean? <laughs> so here's the thing. Interview is kind of a weird experience if you think about it, right? There are so many interviews we're going to have in our lifetime. So it's absolutely normal to be, no to be nervous. And everyone, pretty much everyone has those nerves. It's normal because it's a weird experience. Now, what I meant when I said you need to develop calluses you need to get used to feeling nervous and answering those questions while you're nervous. And same applies to, let's say, public speaking. You need to learn how to be on stage and talk while you're nervous. And it's the same experience. 
So you need to practice when you're nervous, when you're just sitting at your desk by yourself and you're, you're talking through those example examples, you're not very nervous, right? However, if you turn on the, the, the voice note on your phone and you start voice recording yourself, all of a sudden you'll feel like, Ooh, okay. Okay. I wasn't ready for that. Now I'm recording or you record yourself on video or you talk to your family member, friends, and ask them to ask you those questions. All of a sudden, the second there is someone in front of you, you're nervous. And my friend, you need to practice when you're nervous, not just when you are by yourself. And of course, practicing with, let's say a career coach is also very helpful because all of a sudden you're on (laughs) and it's a very different experience. Plus, Of course, having that strategy for how to break down your questions, how to structure your answer and having a strategy for expected. So what we just talked about, right? So preparing the answers ahead of time will be very, very helpful, but also having a strategy for unexpected. So having that structure of how you're going to structure your answer in your head so that when it is a question you didn't prepare for, you can just plug that into that structure the storytelling structure, and you're good to go. So you can do that on the spot. So it's two things, practicing when you're ner- nervous and having a strategy for expected and unexpected. I love that, right? Having a strategy of unexpected, right? Because you're not going to have every single answer or question nailed there, right? So having that structure is key. And one of the things I talk a lot about to add on to this is to really take a moment to breathe. Hmm. When you're nervous, We just need to breathe, pause, silence is powerful, right? That's a great way to handle your nerves. And the other thing is for those who are, let's say, overly prepared, don't try to memorize all your answers, right? Because you're speaking from your head. Instead, really try to speak from your heart so that you're staying present. What could happen sometimes when people are nervous, they are also overly critical or analyzing the answer they just answered that they're not fully present with the interviewer. So one of the strategy is also just letting go the answer that you may just screwed up on and keep on moving. You just have to tell yourself that you're, you're doing great and you keep moving forward there. And this actually happens, I think, very often. You're so nervous that when they're speaking or when you ask them question in your head, you're like, oh, okay, I have two minutes to breathe. I don't have to think that hard anymore. So you just disconnect and you don't even hear what they're saying. If this has happened to you before, let me know because I just see this happen way too many times. And then you walk out of the interview and you're like, oh, I actually did not even understand the role that well because I couldn't listen to them because I was so nervous that those few minutes when they were talking, I just wanted to, to breathe, relax, and I couldn't really focus. So I think it's a, it's a really good point, Diana. Yeah, yeah. We have a quick question from the audience. I love the engagement, by the way. There's so many people interacting right now and asking questions. So we'll try to answer as many as we could here. So one question was: how will an applicant know the problem of the company or the problem of the role that they need to solve here? So I'm I'm gonna add a quick my few cents of this. I would say the key here is why not not only you read the job posting, but you really need to ask those questions when you're talking to the initial phone screen to the recruiter or the hiring manager. Ask probing questions. Why is this role open? What does this person need to achieve within the next year or the first 90 days? What's really are the core challenges here? Ask those questions to gather insights to help you prepare for a future rounds of your interviews there. Okay, you won't know just based on reading the job posting. You need to ask questions mm-hmm. to gather insights there. Yeah. And it, the- it goes not just for, for candidates. It's actually the same on the inside as well. When a recruiter is working with a hiring manager, just that job description is not enough. You actually need to talk to them yeah. and ask them questions. And the exact same questions that Diana just, just asked were the questions that we would ask the hiring manager. Why is this role open? Gives you so much intel around what's going on. I think it's yeah. one of my favorite questions. <laughs> Absolutely. And I'll tell you something like when I was recruiting at Google, I would be filling a, quite a few account executive roles for various industries and verticals. So but that same job posting. 
So mm -hmm. as a candidate, you need to ask the questions around like what vertical it is, what industry, what kind of clients, what are the challenges to get even specific insights to understand how you'll be a great fit for that particular industry vertical there. Right. Not just from the job posting. So let's move on to the next question. The next question that we have here, Anna. Yeah, let's talk about some of the red flags in an interview. Oh, <laughs> red flags. I want to hear the audience. What are some red flags you pick up in interviews? Because there are definitely red flags. And do you actually trust yourself? Or how, how many of you have actually accepted a role despite knowing there are red flags in an interview? So I'm going to address a few because I've definitely seen quite a few. One of the things that I've noticed this past year is because there's so many changes happening at work, whether it's layoffs, restructuring, uh, people quitting their jobs, things are always moving and changing. And so what I've noticed is that some of my clients who accepted the job offer afterwards realized within either the first month or first few months, it's not the right job offer. And looking back, there were red flags mm -hmm. that they've noticed in an interview. So I really want to encourage all of you to pay attention to them. Typically, number one is around the people, right? The people that you meet, as an example, when you meet them, are they excited about the work that they do? Or are they feeling burnt out in, in the job? And you can pick up a lot of clues based on how they show up, whether they're late to a meeting or whether they're really talking poorly about the work that they do. All those are red flags. Or I have a client recently after the initial interview with a high manager, she was asked to meet with the team of the team members. All of them did not show up because they were stuck in a meeting or they forgot about it, right? That's already a potential uh, red flag there. Or the another, number second one is around process. The process of the interview. Are you going through multiple rounds of interviews, so many rounds that they have no idea what they are looking for. I just had a client recently where she had to do a case interview. They gave it to her on the long weekend, like the Friday before the long weekend in May. I'm like, ding, 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 that is red flag number one. This is an indicator. Most likely you're gonna to need to work on the long weekend. Mm -hmm. The day of the presentation, she was told they sent her the wrong case and asked her to do another case the following weekend. I'm like, ding, ding, ding. That's another wow. red flag that they were not showing empathy or figuring out ways of how can we leverage the existing case. They wanted my client to do another case. And then they were asked to meet with the, the director last minute the very next day because the director was going to um, going on vacation. And so that's another red flag because I said that the, it's really their agenda of what they want versus really understanding what works for you. Okay, so those to me are some red flags there. I have so many times where my clients where they were asked to do a case interview over a long weekend. I was like, that is an indicator. It's exactly what's going to happen when you're in the job. Mm -hmm. Anything you want to add, Anna? I'm sure you've seen a ton as well. I mean, there, there are a lot. And I think these were, those were some bigger ones. But something that I want for you guys to watch out for, and I was actually on the radio on Monday this week talking about interview red flags. And uh, something that we talked about was when you are asking questions in an interview, don't just listen to words that they say, but look for more subtle signs. So look for how their body language changed, if it changed, how did they react about I reacted to the question itself. Yeah. So those are more important even than the words that they say. And I think we forget about it. And my friends, if you, if you have a bad feeling, that gut feeling that something's off here, trust it because it probably is. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah, let's let's look at some audience. Like someone said, Vanessa said here, dry personality of the interviewer. Interview does not flow. It seems like if we reflected the poor culture fit uh, there. Yeah, that's a great one, right? Yeah, same here. As a interview shows a bored expression on their face. You know, one thing I sometimes I find it sad too. Like when I think about my clients, they're so well prepared for an interview, and the interviewer does not show up showing interest in the interview or excited to meet this new candidate. It, it It's hard, even as a candidate, we prepare so much that it, that doesn't flow there. So I always want to encourage as well as employers to also be well prepared as well when they go interview so they can have a really great, meaningful conversation there. Yes. Um, so we have a question. Yeah. 
Oh, I'm going to say someone said here as a red flag when one of the interviewers appears distracted. Mm. It can be a red flag. Something that in general with red flags that I also want you to keep in mind, as with any red flag in any with anything in life, it can be a red flag or it can just be a misunderstanding, right? So when someone is distracted, maybe something huge happened in their life that morning, family, or they got into an accident on the way to work right? You have no idea why that's happening. So it can be a red flag. So question it, pay attention to it, but it's not necessarily a red flag. And even with, you know, Danny, you talked about the process, right? If it's disorganized and you're asked to meet with someone last minute, it is a red flag, but it can be disorganized because it's maybe a brand new recruiter who just started last week and they're just getting around to, to learning the process. So dig a little bit deeper as to why this red flag is coming up. Yeah. Yeah. And I think here, even being the interviewee, if you're feeling it's off, I think it's okay sometimes to check in. Like you just never know. Someone might be just having a lot going on, right? If they're totally not present with you, it could just be a check-in to see where their headspace is at. And, you know, oftentimes I can just bring them back because you're interrupting their rhythm to bring them back to the present moment as well there. Yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. Yeah, I love all the engagement right now that people are typing in of, of red flags. At the end of the day, trust your gut. Trust your gut. There are so many different things that could be happening behind the scenes there, right? Absolutely. So let's move on to our next question that we have here is, what strategies can candidates use to showcase their unique skills and experiences in an interview? <laughs> well, that's a, that's a big question. So we're going to, we're going to stay concise here and do three. As, as I already said in the beginning, I love things in three. So the first one we have briefly talked about already, and that's connecting the dots for the employer. So you're going to look at, and we mentioned the job description, and looking for the most important things that they're looking for from someone. So find three and then find the experiences that you have that show them that you have that experience, you have those skills that they're looking for and connect the dots for them. And I would do that in the very beginning. I would do that in tell me about yourself so that the three things that you're highlighting in tell me about yourself are the three most important things that they're looking for. So this way from the very beginning, they're like, oh my gosh, I cannot wait to hear more. This sounds like a perfect candidate. So that's number one. Number two, when it comes to showing your unique skills and experiences. Don't be afraid to bring up some personal experiences. So that can be family, that can be travel, that can be hobbies. It can be how you grew up. So for example, this morning, the mock interview that I had with my client, he grew up on a sheep farm in Australia (laughs) and he's going for a VP of communications role. So you might think, well, how, how are those two connected? Well, When he talks about growing up on a sheep farm, he talks about it being a very challenging experience. He developed a lot of resilience, working as and collaborating as part of a group because you need that on a big farm. And he brought that back to the interviewer because a big role, a big part of the role was collaboration. So this way, when he walks out of that interview, he is not just going to be remembered as someone who has 10 years of experience in communication. He's going to be remembered as Matt who grew up on a sheep farm. So don't be afraid of bringing up those personal experience experiences, but again, connect them to what matters to the employer. And then mm-hmm. finally, number three, what you are insecure about, <laughs> something that you think is different about you. So we're typically insecure about things that make us different. Use that. Use that as your differentiation point. Use that as your selling point. And I'll give you a few examples. I've had people say that, hey, I have three kids. Like, who would hire me for this high level role? It's, it's going to be really hard for me as a mom. Instead, we actually brought that up in her tell me about yourself and made that her selling point because she said, hey, my kids are actually my why. I want them to be proud of me. So all of a sudden, something that she was so insecure about and thought would prevent her from getting those high level roles is now something that she's making her selling point. Another one can be uh, can be, I, I get a lot of clients who have international experience, for example, and they feel like, Hey, because I don't have this 
experience, local experience, it's going to be really hard for me to, to stand out. But instead, we look at that international experience and look at it from a perspective of, well, what did I learn working somewhere else in a different country that someone else doesn't have? So take what makes you unique, what makes you different, and bring it up in your interview. Make it your selling point. So those are the three. So connect the dots for the employer. Don't be afraid to bring up personal experiences and sell what makes you unique. I love that. I love that. What I'm hearing in the takeaway is turn a perceived weakness into an asset. Right? And then this is a great way that one thing I love doing is to actually think of what are those perceived objection points and how will you counter that so that you are building a strong business case. At the end of the day, like even what you're, you're teaching here, Anna, it's all about how do I build a strong business case that I am the star candidate for this job. And so you want to really think about what's going to make differentiate you, what will make you stand out, and what will make it an asset to the employer. And what you're highlighting here is something I talk a lot about is to be able to really talk about the benefits of hiring you. A lot of times when we answer the question, why hire you? Most people will just summarize the X years of experience and skills that they have, but they don't talk about the so what or the benefits mm -hmm. of how they can help the employer to achieve the goal to solve the problem or the incremental uh, benefits and value that you can add to the role. When you can do that, that's really showcasing that you get them, that you're really connecting uh, the dots there. Yeah, I love this. All right, this is juicy. Oh my goodness. We have like an all-time high of people live here, over like 140 people live with us right now, Anna, who are still active. I want to ask the audience, what are you learning so far? Like, what are some key takeaways? I think we only have a couple questions left, and then we're going to see what questions we have in the audience. And we're going to share a little bit more about the work we do, of how you can also uh, work with us to support your uh, job search and interview journey here. Okay, so next question here, Anna. All right. Well, let's talk about, it's probably one of my favorite topics, and I feel like I say that about all topics, but uh, I would love to to chat a little bit about nonverbal communication and what role it plays in interviews. Oh, this is a good one. What role does nonverbal communication <laughs> yeah. play? This is a big one, I have to say, because studies have shown that 93% of your message impact is based on nonverbal, which is your body language and tone of, and tone of voice. Only 7% is based on words. So how you say what you say does matter. So oftentimes people focus on their content of what to say, but don't spend enough time on how they're going to say it, how they want to show up. And that is what's what really going to make you stand out in an interview in terms of that first impression. So there's a book by Vanessa Bed Edwards on cues. And she talks a lot about to be a charismatic communicator. It's a balance of warmth and competence. So the warmth, it's all about your facial expressions, right? The eye contact, the smile, your energy, how you make other people feel. That's the warmth piece, right? So if you are nervous most of the time, you may not be smiling. So just a simple tweak of just showing more warmth can make um, build more trust factor there. The other piece is around confidence. It's all about that credibility factor, right? Are you also telling your stories in a way that sounds, um, uh, credible, relatable, right? Do they understand it? All that's going to make a difference. So I think even our posture matters, like the way we sit, like, are you sitting in a way that shows engagement? Like, are you leaning in, leaning forward versus whether you are slouching or just like moving your chair, all that leaves an impression out there, right? So I'm a big believer, especially in the virtual environment, we want to amplify our energy, especially if you are doing a virtual interview or you're doing a presentation where you can't see anyone. And it's like oftentimes I talk to in front of hundreds of people. We need to mentally amplify our own energy so that people can feel us. So one of my tricks is I have like pictures of my kids behind the screen here. I see them smiling and it gets me smiling naturally as well. I love that so much. <laughs> I love that so much. And uh, I love that you talked about smile because it's so simple. It's probably the, the easiest thing you can do to instantly be seen and perceived as a much stronger candidate. And in fact, that's the feedback that I gave my client this morning. 
smile. Yeah. And it's as simple as write on a post-it note, smile and put it on your computer. Because we forget we're so focused on what to say and how to say it. And we're nervous that we forget. And by the way, if it's an interview over the phone, it's a phone interview, mm -hmm. same thing applies. People can hear you smile. Yeah, it's even more say, important. More important. It still applies. Yeah, yeah. It's so funny you say this. I oftentimes will write a happy face and I'll put the poster note to show my client where they're talking. Yeah. Smile. Yeah, exactly. I did the same thing this morning. <laughs> <laughs> powerful non-verbal yes yeah. David said that absolutely right I really believe that can make a huge difference it's not just what you say but how you say it and how you make others feel that will help make you the star candidate to ease the interview there mm -hmm. yeah yeah so our final question here Anna that uh, have for you is how can han how can candidates handle difficult or unexpected questions in an interview mm hmm well, number one, take a breath. <laughs> it's okay. You can do this. Now, ask for time. It's absolutely okay to say, that's a great question. Do you mind if I take a minute to think of my answer? You don't have to have all the answers coming out on demand. It's okay to take your time. It's okay to take a minute to think about what you're going to say. Now, don't do that with tell me about yourself. <laughs> Those kind of questions should be prepared. But if it is an unexpected question, just take a breath and ask for time. Now, number two here is to have the structure for your answer, to have the kind of the skeleton memorized. And there, there are different ways people approach it. There is the star method. There is the car method. I actually teach my own method and uh, it's more focused on action and results and bringing up result twice in the beginning and at the end. But whatever is the method that you use, have that in your head and you need to practice enough times to be able to, to easily plug in a new example into that, into that structure. But once you have that memorized, it actually makes it a lot easier to do a new example, just plugging it into that structure. And mm -hmm. number three, because I know you're nervous and it's unexpected question, you might forget everything that you've learned. You might forget the, the structure, the, the car, the star, just everything goes out of the window because you're deep down, you're freaking out. So if that happens, simplify it. So this entire time, this for the last hour, I've been saying three things, right? Every time I get a question, I'm like, I'm going to do three, three points here. So the reason we do that is because three is the smallest number that creates a pattern. But it also is something that is easy to to memorize. And it's easy for someone when they hear it to process it. So just three. You just need three. So if you forget everything, all the structure, you just need three things and you need a result. You need to sum it up. You need to bring up the result. It can be what you learned. So very, it can be as simple as that. So yeah. take a breath, ask for time, have the structure for your answer, memorize just the skeleton itself. And then if you forget everything, three things. I love it. I'm a big fan of power threes. And for those who are very data driven, studies have shown when you use the power of three, you do appear more intelligent and more strategic as well. This has been studies that are shown by like Harvard as well. So using the power three rules is very, very powerful. A lot of executives like using that as well. So amazing. So Anna, I know there's still a lot of people online here. What we're going to do next is we're going to talk a little bit about um, the work that we do. And then we're going to answer some questions. Like if we have some time, we're going to answer some questions. There are a lot of great questions coming in. So we're going to do our best to answer the questions here. So Anna, can you share a little bit about um, how does your online course prepare individuals to be the star candidate? Mm -hmm. So my friends, for those of you who feel like, hey, I want to take this to the next level. And I want to make sure that with my next interview, I go in with confident confidence, because you know that you're ready, that you're prepared, and you're prepared for both expected and unexpected, just no more nerves. <laughs> if you want to know how to 
market your experience, how to connect the dots for the employer. We've talked about it a lot today so that they go, we must hire you. This is the person, <laughs> by the way, this has happened to me in my last job interview when I was still in the corporate world, just 15 minutes in the hiring manager said, what would it take for you to come on board? And for someone who used to be an international student and was really struggling in the beginning of my career, that meant a lot. So I teach you exactly how to connect the dots for interviewer to get that. And if you want to know how to wow the interviewer and not only with the strategy and connecting the dots, but also the communication hacks based on really psychology for people to pay attention to you and for people to like you, all of that I teach you step by step inside my master the interview course. It's self paced. You go in, you prep for the interview, and you're ready to go. Yeah, that's a fantastic resource. I highly recommend it because I know you put a lot of time and effort in your courses. Anna, so for those who want to really get more training, more in depth, definitely check out Anna's Master Your Interview course. And I'm going to add on for myself the work that I do, very complimentary to, to Anna as well. So I primarily do a lot of one on one coaching. So for those who for those who actually want some mock interview training, I do a lot of that. So typically, clients who come to me when they've been in the same company, same role for a very long time and not gone through an interview, and they're very nervous, and they have a last minute interview, they um, get a coaching session with me. So typically, that first session is a 90 minute strategy planning session to help you analyze the job, the interviewers, the company to help you predict those questions. And then from there, we move into practicing your question, the second session. And our third or fourth session is all about polishing there. I've done a lot of also case interviews, especially for those who are in very analytical roles, product roles, finance roles, marketing roles. If you have a case interview, I've done thousands of cases, uh, having done gone through my undergrad and MBA through uh, case studies there. That's something I do a lot. And for those, I have my executive level clients who have to do 90 day, um, their 90 day plan type of pitch interview. I also help with that, helping them really strategize the how to go about presenting their ideas in a way that really convinces the employers. I've done mock interviews where I've clients haven't gone through a very rigorous process, like academic interviews, where they have multiple rounds, multiple panels. I've done those type of mock interview prep as well. So for those who are going through some really tough interview situations and you really want that customized one-on-one -on -one approach, I can help you with through the one-on-one -on -one interview coaching or even like last minute bookings on the weekends as well. So feel free to check that out on my website at mymarkability.com and click on interview coaching. And for Anna, I share that link as well that they can also check on your mm -hmm. website on master the interviews as well, the course. Okay. And I'll, I'll also mention a special offer. <laughs> uh, so right now, uh, Master the Interview is uh, going through the bonus enrollment period. It actually ends tomorrow. So we're almost at the end. And there's only one bonus left, and that is the best one. So I always save the best for last. And that's the salary negotiation scripts. So when you join Master the Interview by tomorrow, you'll get my proven salary negotiation, negotiation scripts that got my clients up to double their original offer. Multiple people were able to double their original offer with those scripts. So <laughs> mind blowing, <laughs> never stops to amaze me the kind of results that people achieve. And uh, for those of you who are on the live, so that's nowhere on, on my website right now, nowhere on social media. But for those of you who are live here, I have one extra bonus for you when you join Master the Interview by tomorrow. And that's a special series with a communications coach that I did where we go step by step through what to do when you get nervous. So it's called Ditch the Nerves. <laughs> so if you freeze, if you ramble, if you get awkward, <laughs> we got you covered. We give you very small, actionable tips love those tips. Everyone always loves those, those series of on how to handle those common communication pitfalls. So head to Amazing. the current die.com forward slash interview. Amazing, amazing. Oh, salary negotiation is a huge one. I feel like we can have another show on just salary <laughs> negotiation. So that's great that you're offering this bonus because that's definitely could be a huge game changer with really um, increasing your, your offer there. Amazing. So let's just take a few questions. Um, mm -hmm. Are you okay with time, Anna? Yes, Check absolutely. Some questions from the audience. There's so much going on. If For those who have a question you really want to answer, feel free to add it in because there were so many chats coming in. Um, someone asked, like, should you bring a resume to an interview? I'll, I'll take this one. Um, I don't think you need to. 
<laughs> I don't think they need to. I don't think you need to. They already have your resume in front of them. So I, I just wouldn't really focus yeah. on that. Especially if it's a virtual these days, like they should have it in front of them as well there, right? Unless you want it just for your for, your, for yourself there. Uh, the next one is around, our portfolio is a good idea to leave with a hiring manager after the interview. So I would say it depends. Like if you are in a role that's like say a copywriter or like a UX researcher where they like to have portfolios, definitely, right? So it really depends on the nature of the job, like roles that have that, that let's say if you're a designer, having a portfolio would be helpful, but not necessary for every single role out there. Um, someone asked like the dress code for virtual interviews. I think I saw one. Um, what should I dress in a virtual interview, mm. a video interview? Mm. It's a good question. So it's 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 kind of two-sided when you think about what to wear. On the one hand, you don't want to be remembered <laughs> by what you wore. That's one thing to think about. On the other hand, you also don't want to be under underdressed in a way that you're you're kind of a level under compared to what the interviewer is wearing. So if you're one step up from what the interviewer is wearing, good. But you don't want to be 10 steps away from what the interviewer is wearing. So assess what kind of interview you're having, what the company is. Is it more casual? Is it a startup? Is it more, um, more formal? And go from there. But if, if, if you are in doubt, I heard it from, from someone once and I think it's it's so simple, but it really helps. Ask someone, put something on yeah. and ask your, your significant other, ask your family member, what do you think? Yeah, and more importantly, it's, do you feel good, right? Mm -hmm. Do you feel good and feel confident at the end of the day? I wanna add a little bit of video interview in terms of um, our setup as well too. Mm. Like I think even from a framing standpoint, I think my rule of thumb is like that your, your arms length that you can also showcase a little bit about your upper torso as well, like not just like the talking head type of video, because showing posture in your hands is a way to build trust in a video uh, setting there. So, so pay attention to the setup of the interview, the lighting, the audio, all those would matter in terms of a first impression standpoint. The next question here, I think from, let's see here, how to get to know about the team if the interview doesn't let us talk to my actual future manager or the team? That's a good question. Ooh. Ooh, <laughs> I am going to say that this sounds like a red flag to me because you absolutely need to talk to your future manager and ideally the team. So that's really how I would look at it. And I would push for it. I would ask for it if they, if they don't, if they say that that's not part of the interview process, I would really question if it is the right environment and the right opportunity. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, sometimes the situations where I've seen, if you don't get to talk to your future manager, it could be also they're hiring at the same time. I mean, the role that has not been yeah. yet. Yeah. That could happen. So you just need to understand why, uh, why that's happening out there. Right. Yeah. But and, you do and want here's ask. where I would, I would for, for yourself, think about how important it is to you to have a certain type of leader so if they haven't hired that person, personally, myself, I don't think I would, I would say yes to the offer yet, because I want to make sure that it's the right leader for me. And it's also okay to say that it's also okay to say, Hey, I know that you're still hiring for this, this role. And I would love to, to meet that person first before I say yes. Can we, can we pause on this really is very personal at this point, but Personally, I would always want to talk to to the hiring manager, to the someone, I agree. someone who I would be reporting to. Yeah, I mean, studies have shown that your direct manager has a huge impact on your mental health and happiness oh and performance gosh, yes. at work. <laughs> That's a whole other topic. So yeah. I do think this is important. Like, and when you think about it, a new manager coming in, they could be making new changes. They could have a different criteria of who they're looking for compared to their other boss, right? So, so I do think it is important to even hold off a bit or ask more probing questions there. So next question. Okay, this is this is good. Um, do employers look at written recommendations on LinkedIn? I think it depends. Like to me, I think it's usually maybe recruiters when they are searching for that talent, they may look at that. It's helpful, but it's not necessarily a must there. Johan has a question here. Uh, what are your thoughts on creating a pitch deck or show to showcase your value? 
Obviously, it can be time consuming, but is it truly worth the effort there? I think it depends. Like the question it really is, depends. is this, mm-hmm. it, it really, really depends. I think if it's for those who are in like a more junior type role, you don't really need it. But it's if it's for a very highly competitive role, a, a pretty big uh, role there, or if it's a role that's brand new, I think having a pitch deck to showcase your vision or your 90 day plan could help solidify more clarity of how you want to set yourself up for success in the role. I have had once when I was an agency recruiter where the employer was about to make an offer to candidate A, candidate B was like the second choice, came in with like a pitch deck and got the offer. I have seen that happen, like just a few instances there. So it depends like what you, whether you feel that will give you that competitive edge there, especially if you know that you may have like a perceived weakness or something that you're lacking, mm-hmm. whether that will help you uh, there. So yeah. Oh my goodness, Anna, we have so many great questions here. Okay, we're going to wrap up soon in a couple of minutes. Uh, when you're a leader in the role, how to answer strategically, tell me about your experience or walk me through your resume. This is a good question. Do you want me to take this first? And- um, yeah, maybe maybe you can start. So I'm assuming when you're a leader, like either you are in a manager role with people that you manage or you're at a VP level. So one of the things that I always talk about is you want to balance between of what did you do versus what did you influence other or what did you delegate? Right? So you want to highlight that thing that you've done and, the, and that's and what you've done to delegate to others. That's a key piece of advice. So you want to talk about essentially your progression as a leader how you've built, let's say, teams, how you empower people, how have you been able to achieve the overall um, goals of that ties back into the business objective. I think one of the key things as you move up in an organization, you want to be able to tie it back to the business. So not just you as an individual contributor, but you as a leader and overall contribution to the business objectives, the KPIs, that's really important. You want to speak specifically, like, what are those metrics of success and how did you really move uh, the needle there? That's really important, I think. Mm -hmm. Anything you want to add, Anna? Yes. So something that I also noticed with, you know, when you're going for a leader role, so oftentimes by that point, you would have quite a few years of experience at that point. And that was actually something that we also talked uh, during the mock interview with my client this morning. So what tends to happen often is you, you tend to try to to cover everything and show them that, hey, I've done so much. Look, like this is so broad, so diverse, so many years of experience. And they already know that, right? They have your resume in front of them. So instead, you want to back what we, to what we talked about earlier, connect the dots for them, right? So out of all of those years of experience that you have and the breadth and depth of experience that you have, choose and pick and choose what's most important to them. So if there is something that you take away today is pick and choose what's important to them and highlight that in your experience. Not everything. Your goal is not to show them that you have all of those years of experience. They know that they want to see that you're right for this role. Absolutely. And I'm going to tie back into this one. So Lisa asked that when you have more than 25 years experience of how to answer the tell me about yourself, I want to tell a quick story. I once had a client with over 20 years experience managing a huge, massive organization, like over 9,000 people, wow. very successful career. And she had a in- big interview with the CEO of a huge insurance company. And she had not had to look for a job for over 20 years. And so when we practice the tell me about yourself question, the first try she told her entire life story mm-hmm. of how she <laughs> progressed when I first started in this role, then moved to this, then moved to this. Most people by default do that. Yeah. Okay, by default, most people chronologically. What I want to challenge you to do, what we've been talking about here, is really thinking about what is the theme, right? This ties back to branding. What is your theme that you're trying to tell? Like, what's the impression you're trying to leave? Like, if your theme is you want to showcase that you are a strategic leader who can manage like a huge, amazing, like multi million dollar projects and cross functional teams. That's your entire story of telling me about yourself of how your entire career has been that and showcase that breadth of being a leader, uh, managing people and influencing. You want to tell that theme consistently. And that's how they feel in terms of the stories and the roles that you've had versus telling every single role. That's the case. So I totally hear you, Lisa, because when I work with people with a lot of experience, the tendency is to tell everything. And that's not the key here. Everything that we're sharing right now is we want to be strategic. We want to be intentional, right? Pick your top threes. 
Pick your yeah. theme here. <laughs> that's how you stand out as a star candidate. And I know that's hard because when you think about this, right, it's like when we're out looking at ourselves, we're like, I've done so much. How am I just going to cut to the top three? Think of your top three proud career highlights, right? Your top three proud career highlights. And why was that significant? What impact did you make? And identify the common themes and pattern here. Like, what are you really, really known for? That's how you pick them. And also pick them based on what is important for this role that you're after. Exactly. That is so, so important there. Like I working with another HR client right now where he works, he's done a lot of different type of org restructuring in like internationally, but that's his theme. Like make sure you tell those stories that you've gone mm-hmm. through all these different type of HR scenarios that you can help this organization there. Right. Anthony's just uh, here, like communicate your leadership brand. Right? Communicate your leadership brand and what makes you stand out. Amazing. So wrap up. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Like, tell us, like, what are your biggest takeaways? I think we had, this is one of our most popular sessions, Anna. So <laughs> this was fantastic having you here with us today. I had so much fun with our audience here. So did we I. still have, like, almost like 100 people still with us here right now. So that is amazing. Oh, what just happened here? <laughs> oh, I think I pressed the wrong button here, <laughs> showcasing the chat. Um, yeah, what I'm taking away, I just want to share, like I'm seeing from the audience question here is, yes, you may get nervous with interviews. It's normal. It's okay. Address those fears. Right? You can be um, prepared for an interview, but you don't want to be so overly prepared that you need to rehearse those answers. You want to be able to get to speaking from your heart at the end of the day, not from your head to really connect with the interviewer. And how frameworks and structure to help guide you through in telling your story of why you're the ideal candidate to hire. Talk about the benefits of hiring you. Think of promise statements or commitment statements as well, right? So that you can see how you'll be a great fit for the role there. Okay. Amazing. Oh my goodness. I, I love all the feedback. So much, um, a lot of clapping emojis right now. You probably don't see this, but I'm opened up my, my phone here. A lot of love. That's a uh, popping up on my phone right now. A lot of thank you. So, so thank you so much for being here all. This was so good. Make sure to check out our work here. If you're looking to work with Anna, the master your interview course, amazing bonus right now, go check it out uh, of her course. And if you're looking for some mock interview, one-on-one coaching here, feel free to contact me as well there. Hi. Amazing. Well, thank you so much, everyone. And thank you so much, Anna, for co-hosting this Thank you me. for I, having me. I had so much fun. <laughs> I'm already seeing more collaborations down the road, right? I would love that. I'm definitely seeing more collaborations down the road. This was so fun, so fluid, so easy as well. So take care, everyone. Thank you so much. Bye now. Bye.